Um, so we're, gonna, we're moving from a fairly uh, computationally intensive uh, talk to uh, a much less computationally intensive talk. I'm going to be talking primarily about using case law for more traditional doctrinal research uh, and sort of going to give some context to, about um, uh, uh, you, uh, sort of t uh, taking what I would consider fairly traditional uh, doctrinal questions that uh, law professors and so forth uh, and other scholars have been interested in and potentially answering not quite as well as they should have and hopefully uh, the case laxis project uh, provides them a, a better tool to help answer some of these questions so um, it is not a new idea that uh, case law is a rich source of data um, uh, uh, and it has been long argued and suggested that uh, it has not been scientifically exploited. Any guess on when this quote is from? Anyone recognize it? This is from the uh, president of the ALS in 1928. And I think a lot of people would suggest that not much has necessarily changed over time. Um, uh, uh, there is a lot of reading of uh, case material and not necessarily as much systematic analysis of it. I think this is, uh, um, the, uh, uh, many scholars have pointed this out over the decades. A um, recent example is uh, Bo Chilton Milani's article in 2017. Um, they review uh, sort of uh, references to uh, doctrinal claims and the amount of support that, uh, and the, the basis of support that uh, uh, scholars have for making doctrinal claims. Um, uh, the, this is just looking at one year, the, uh, hand coding it. And the, the vast bulk of doctrinal claims, and including the most central doctrinal claims that scholars are making, are basically come about from uh, string sites. So, you know, th throw in sites to three cases, and then you demonstrate <laughs> your point, at least by the uh, norms of the field. Um, what is interesting to note is that uh, almost a quarter of the uh, uh, major claims that are being made in articles in this year, I think they were looking at 2016, um, uh, did rest on some more, uh, some larger uh, attempt at more systematic analysis of the relevant case law. And I think that this is a, um, these efforts have been, been increasing substantially over time, if you uh, follow along with the Legal Academy. Uh, and uh, indeed, if you uh, take a look at it, um, a, a lot of people can point to very systematic analyses. In, um, in my particular interests, one of the areas that has been uh, most influenced uh, by uh, major scholarship that rests on systematic analysis of case law is actually in remedies uh, and the work of Doug Laycock, Doug Laycock uh, who, uh, gosh, it's almost been 30 years, <laughs> uh, argued uh, uh, in 1990, 1990 uh, article in 1990, book in 1991, that the irreparable injury rule was dead. Um, now, I realize we have a fairly mixed audience here. So um, I, the irreparable injury rule is the rule that courts will not uh, rule to prevent harm uh, if monetary damages could adequately compensate for the injury after the effect. This is, uh, there's a preference for legal remedies over equitable remedies uh, if, in fact, uh, uh, legal remedies are adequate. Um, uh, Doug Laycock spent nearly a decade in the 1980s uh, review, uh, uh, with the support of a number of research assistants over time, collecting and analyzing 1,400 cases. And if you are familiar with the legal tools uh, and resources at the time, this was not an easy task. Um, and. Uh, you know, and it's fair to say that his work set the ground uh, uh, um, for a lot of subsequent work uh, in the area of remedies. It also set the standards for um, sort of what ambitious systematic and um, uh, content analysis of ju judicial opinions look like. Um, a review by Hall and Wright sort of uh, sort of suggests that starting in the 1990s is when we see. A substantial increase in ed efforts at systematic case uh, case law analysis. Um, so if you look, you see, you know, a, a bit of it in the um, tracing back even back to the 1950s, but it's still quite limited. And usually, that these these analyses they're looking at early in these decades are of a hundred cases here or there. Starting in the um, um, 1990s and um, subsequently we, uh, uh, in the legal research, you see a lot uh, more efforts 
at systematic analysis of cases, uh, oftentimes in the, in, on the order of uh, reviewing hundreds of cases uh, uh, and occasionally thousands of cases. Um, and so you see a, a general trend, particularly over the last couple of decades, to try to do more systematic uh, case law analysis. Uh, but uh, I, there still are uh, substantial critiques of how this is done, um, uh, questions about uh, uh, sampling bias, questions about uh, systematic coding. There's a, a whole range of literature uh, that focuses on this. Um, I will say that uh, the tools that we have now, uh, the LexisNexis, Westlaw, et cetera, have made it a lot easier for legal scholars to do a case law analysis, even without case law access project. Uh, um, uh, and so you see uh, regularly, you know, probably do, uh, a few dozen articles every year published that um, do systematic uh, reviews of cases. I will um, highlight a couple of my colleagues because I always want to give them the shots out. Um, uh, Richard Ray has an uh, article that he's just come out in the Harvard Law Review and, uh, on the Marx Rule. Um, uh, for the Marx rule is the uh, interpretive rule that the uh, Supreme Court uh, laid down on how, uh, we'll just say, fragmented uh, Supreme Court decisions should be interpreted as uh, what is binding precedent. The uh, Marx rule suggests that you should take the um, uh, narrowest uh, concurring decision, uh, and that is what should be binding. That is, needless to say, a difficult thing to determine, uh, as you might imagine, and that's why uh, Richard, for example, suggests alternatives to, uh, uh, that, uh, that the Marx rule should probably be abandoned. Um, uh, we also see, uh, and, and in, in doing this, he reviews basically every, uh, um, since, since uh, Marx was um, uh, done, he reviews every uh, court case uh, uh, in the, uh, the Courts of Appeals uh, and, and uh, state Supreme Courts that uh, relies on, the, uh, that references Marx uh, and relies on, uh, on the Marx rule or decides not to rely on the Marx rule in some cases. Um, and this, this effort, uh, I would say uh, his, his work process, process on this project is fairly traditional. Uh, you go to LexisNexis, you go to Westlaw, you uh, figure out everything that cites uh, uh, Marx, you uh, hand code a data set, or rather you have RAs who are willing um, <laughs> Uh, willing, I don't know. <laughs> that might be a little hard, but you know, it's it, it's it's a it's a labor intensive, quite manual process for uh, reviewing everything. Um, I, uh, Joanna Schwartz uh, did this, what I would say is a very similar process on uh, reviewing more than twelve hundred cases of um, Section nineteen eighty three cases. These are um, uh, cases. Um, uh, filed against state and local law enforcement for violation of uh, civil rights. Uh, and uh, her particular interest is in the use of qualified immunity defense and whether it serves the purposes that the Supreme Court says it should. Um, and again, uh, you know, a, 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 what I would consider a fairly typical traditional process of a law professor working with a, you know, a small army of research assistants, hand coding cases, uh, and, you know, suspending several you know, several years of um, uh, work on, on this sort of project. And so um, I wanted to, uh, one of the things, one of my jobs at the uh, UCLA uh, is I, I direct uh, the Empirical Research Group and, uh, um, and advise any of these uh, projects that involve statistical analysis. And uh, when I heard about the uh, case law access project, it, um, I immediately thought to the, these various labor-intensive projects that um, uh, scholars have been doing um, uh, over the years. I thought, well, is this something that could be done better, uh, uh, in better ways? And so that's what we at the law school uh, at UCLA have been exploring. Um, and we're still quite early on, but I want to talk a little bit about that for the, uh, the remainder of my talk. Um, I will say that for the sort of systematic case law research of the type we're talking about, that, which I would consider fairly traditional doctrinal research, there's a natural workflow. Um, a, a researcher starts out by specifying a research question, uh, then you find and select cases to analyze, you then have some usually uh, manual process of transforming cases into data, uh, and then you analyze the data at the end. Um, this is a fairly standard uh, approach to doing a lot of research, but certainly for systematic, uh, traditional uh, doctrinal uh, 
systematic case law analysis, I think that this is a fairly standard process. I'm going to focus primarily on the value added of the case law access project to these middle two steps. Um, this, this is not to say I don't think it's a, a, this project can be valuable for the first or the fourth step. Okay, I, I think specifically, and I think that uh, the the presence of the, uh, this the, of the data, the availability of data and tools can substantially alter and inspire new questions to be asked. I'm very much looking forward to hearing a lot more about that uh, today from the presentations of everyone else. And I do think that it's uh, there are various new tools to be developed that uh, pro provide new methods for uh, analyzing the data. I'm not going to focus on those two aspects, however. Um, I'm just going to focus on the sort of finding and selecting cases and then transforming those cases into data uh, side of uh, and how that can be used, uh, how we're thinking about uh, and are in the process of using uh, the case license project to, uh, to um, improve that process uh, in for traditional doctrinal research. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, two projects that are underway, uh, fairly uh, I would say traditional or straightforward uh, qu uh, legal questions. Um, and uh, they are not necessarily new questions either. But the, I think they are interesting questions. Or, you know, I have my own biases, perhaps. But I think um, the first question is, why do justices cite dissents? And I, um, I'm specifically uh, going to be fo focusing on Supreme Court justices in this case. Um, uh, uh, as many legal scholars do, uh, do, I have colleagues who focus entirely on the Supreme Court. Um, I, I'm interested in. Uh, uh, a lot more, more than that, but uh, I think that it's quite interesting to think about why Supreme Court justices cite dissenting opinions. Uh, and then the second project um, I'm going to talk about is uh, building on uh, re revisiting Laycock's work and um, more generally uh, talking about what harms are irreparable. Um, so why do justices cite dissents? There's a really long literature that uh, discusses and debates why we have written dissents and why there's, for those of you who don't know, the, there's been a rise in uh, the frequency and um, length <laughs> of uh, dissenting opinions uh, uh, in, in courts. Uh, this has been noticed for decades. People have written about it for decades. Um, people talk about it uh, particularly in the context of the US Supreme Court. But you know, there's context about uh, trying to uh, discuss what, what's the role of dissent more generally. The focus is primarily has been on why justices dissent. Um, but I think it's fair to say, and in, um, this is a point that my colleague Richard Ray uh, made in, in starting up this project, uh, why justices cite dissents is understudied. So we have a, a long range of theories that suggest multiple possible answers as to why uh, justices dissent. We could, um, uh, one of which is that they hope that their dissents influence uh, subsequent opinions. And so actually looking at when and why justices cite dissents would seem to be an important aspect of that question. And yet it's surprisingly understudied. So uh, uh, when we, we heard that there was a desire uh, by Richard uh, uh, to work on this project, uh, he started doing what he'd done before, which is uh, he has an RA. So I, Tells the RA, okay, let's go find all the sites to uh, dissenting opinion. Um, what was neat is that his RA this year happens to be somebody who is technically savvy uh, and is quite uh, spent three years before law school uh, working uh, commercially in uh, uh, setting up a, 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 a internal um, interfaces for interacting with APIs for com companies. So I was like, hmm, you know, since you've got a rather uh, savvy um, RA, perhaps we can do, do a little bit more. And indeed, uh, he has. And it's uh, been really interesting to see uh, what somebody uh, uh, has done uh, trying to say, OK, I've been given this traditional project by a, a professor. And, uh, but I have these technical skills, and there's this new fabulous resource out there. How can we do better, make, uh, do a better job of what you know, uh, the professor had assumed was going to be a long multi-year process of, um, you know, hand coding a, a gazillion things. Uh, as I said, this is a, a, a literally a, a project uh, that has uh, just gotten underway in the last month. But it's interesting, and, uh, and I've been sort of um, advising from a distance and uh, hearing back every week or so as the RA 
works its way through uh, inter uh, interacting with the case law uh, API and trying to um, uh, work with the data and clean the data, figure out what makes most sense. So I'm just going to highlight. Um, so again, the original plan uh, that uh, the task given to the research assistant was to develop a, a, a data set, um, you know, uh, basically pull it from LexisNexis, Westlaw, uh, Fine Law, whatever. Uh, he, you know, the professor didn't care. Uh, uh, of uh, all citations to the sense over the last 45 years or so by relying on a keyword search uh, uh, from digital data sources and then hand creating from scratch a data set with all the citations. Needless to say, case law access project makes this a lot easier. Um, and what the uh, RH uh, has chosen to do, at least for the moment, is he pulled all of the Supreme Court decisions, created a data set of all citations with the type of citation, um, and, uh, 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 as well as the various uh, uh, case metadata. Uh, he has the uh, data set that has the text surrounding each citation for, uh, to a dissenting opinion, and, and that he has now created, um, is in the process of creating an interface so that um, if they do choose to go to hand coding as opposed to some sort of uh, uh, natural language processing potentially, which we're uh, discussing and debating at the moment, uh, there, it'll just be an interface where you can literally pull up the citation in the con uh, specific context uh, uh, and read the surrounding paragraph and just work through in a much more efficient fashion. You have the full text, you can uh, pull it up uh, quite easily. Now, the, in talking to the research assistant, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, uh, take Jack at his word and be critical here for a moment. Uh, here's the challenges that uh, we've run into. The first is that the technical skills uh, required for systematically working with the data um, are basically alien to traditional legal researchers, um, law librarians, uh, and actually even most, I would say, most quantitative social scientists, right? Um, you know, the, 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 you know, working in Python or um, uh, scraping uh, stuff from the web is fairly, you know, old hat to data scientists at this point. We've been doing it, uh, we've been doing it for a while, but it is alien to it, uh, to most of what I would say the legal community and the social science community at this point. Um, I, th I think there's a lot of conversations that can be had about how one can improve outreach uh, and potentially develop additional <laughs> tools. Um, I, uh, the statistician who works for me says, you need an R package, you need an R package, and uh, because and that's, you know, like, you, and he's like, I will help with the R package, and, and he says, says, but that's that, he's like, all of the social scientists, you know, the, even the ones who don't know anything about APIs, they can work R packages, get an R package, so, anyway, but, um, you know, fortunately for this particular uh, project, uh, you know, we have somebody who's quite comfortable, uh, I mean, Although, you know, he, he's used to working in Ruby and, and yeah, puts the data in Mongo, and I'm like, oh, God, I don't know if I'm, I'm not used to that, but I can figure it out. Um, <laughs> and so the, in terms of the actual content, however, uh, the biggest concern we have is, is actually the, uh, the quality of the metadata. Um, and uh, this is going to be no surprise to, I think, anybody in the end um, uh, who's worked with it. Um, the, but what I have to say is that in sort of in working with uh, the research assistant on this project, I've been actually really pleasantly surprised. Uh, and I'm just going to focus on on how close and how relatively easy it ought to be to improve the metadata. And this is something that the, you know uh, the RA is going to be doing just for this project right now, but building on the case law uh, 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 pro project uh, as it is. But I think that there's uh, definitely conversations that need to be had about do, doing this at the project end with regards to the uh, metadata. And so, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, in this project, they've just been scraping the Supreme Court, uh, pulling the Supreme Court opinions. But if you take a look at the <laughs> metadata for opinion author, um, this, these, this is the sort of metadata you get. Um, uh, which, uh, let's see, the most, and I, actually, I actually think this is in descending order of frequency. Somebody who actually knows the substance might. Uh, uh, I, I was actually a little surprised. They noticed that uh, you know, per curiam's up at the top. There's a colon there. Per curiam without a colon is somewhere later. Um, you've got uh, Mr. Justice White, uh, Mr. Justice McKenna, Mr. Justice Black, Mr. Justice Reynolds, Mr. Justice White without the comma, Justice Blackman with the comma, Justice Stevens, Justice O something comma. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I, 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 anyway. Um, but, you know, the truth of the matter is this is not actually, you know, in the context of the Supreme Court justices, this is not hard to fix. 
uh, and um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, a fairly straightforward, um, you know, uh, parsing, uh, matching uh, uh, language fixed like all but about eighty of them. Um, uh, uh, I mean, and you just re uh, re remove justice, you remove justice because the OCR problem. You uh, you. Uh, strip out chiefs, you strip out uh, uh, titles, and uh, you could do it. But ideally for a resource that if you want other people to be using, you, you, would, uh, you would want to make this sort of stuff sort of uh, publicly available, or ideally fix, uh, fix the metadata at the source, right? And so I know there are uh, greater challenges to doing this uh, across all 6.7 million cases. The Supreme Court's at the easy end of things. But it's uh, this is the sort of thing that should uh, needs to be done in particular because the the metadata is crucial for um, uh, the uh, working with other uh, combining with other data sources. Um, I should I, I will say uh, that uh, the RA on this project had absolutely no problem merging this data uh, with uh, um, uh, the the WashU uh, Supreme Court uh, database. It was straightforward, easy. Uh, had, it was really nice, uh, and so he was thrilled uh, that that uh, uh, the, at that end that portion of the metadata was really easy to work with and merge on. So anyway, this is um, uh, this is uh, <laughs> the Ari on the project uh, who's uh, just finished up his one L year. Is like, oh, this is this is awesome. I I can't wait to to, to, to uh, use this resource for my note and for everything going forward, and so. He's, he's excited and we're excited uh, to be doing this with this project. I will say, um, you know, uh, this, e even, you know, e you know, setting aside, you know, the, the cleaning and stuff like this, I do think that this, uh, that this resource takes a project that, you know, Richard had been anticipating would take multiple years. That he m might have all the data clean and everything that he wants and uh, uh, coded and analyzed by the end of the summer. Um, so I think it's a substantial benefit for a traditional legal researcher who's interested in systematic case analysis, but not necessarily technically minded. So, so just when we quote you on the website, it went from how long to how long? Uh, don't quote me on this because I have not convinced Richard that we're going to be this fast yet. Okay, but uh, his RA doesn't think so. So uh, anyway, but yes, I, I I think this is a a substantial resource. Now, what I will say though is this is uh, you know. Uh, this is not something that anybody, in, you know, we have a great, a law, uh, for example, law library staff, we have a, a great set of people who supervise RAs. You know, most law schools aren't going to have somebody who could support uh, a, a research assistant or, or the technical skills. And so there's more, I think, that can be done uh, to, to do outreach and develop tools to make this sort of thing uh, more broadly available to less technically um, sophisticated um, researchers. Okay, I'm um, going to switch gears and just spend a couple minutes talking about my own project, uh, which is on irreparable harms. Um, I mentioned the Laycock uh, study before. Um, uh, you know, uh, that the study was almost 30 years ago. Uh, in the recent decades, the Supreme Court has sort of reinforced the importance of judges evaluating whether harms are irreparable before enjoining laws or actions. Um, People talk about uh, sort of uh, in the context of injunctions, at least, uh, sort of setting out the, uh, explicitly a four-part test in the eBay, um, uh, the eBay case in 2006. Uh, and more broadly speaking, there's um, a sense that uh, there's been a reinforcement of the distinction between legal and equitable remedies by the Supreme Court in the last 20 years. Um, this leads to a natural question in my mind and in the mind of, uh, of you know, more serious remedy scholars. I don't consider myself a remedy scholar, but I just find it interesting, uh, is, which is, is the court's insistence on judicial finding of irreparable injury a sign that the irreparable injury rule is not really dead? So is Laycock wrong? Um, uh, uh, and it leads to a, perhaps a, a equally interesting, uh, uh, but um, perhaps slightly more tractable question of, do judges have a consistent understanding of what harms are and are not irreparable? Um, 
And so uh, I, I started thinking about this project a couple years ago, and then you know, last fall when I heard about this, I was like, oh, this will be a fun project to, 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 take, uh, to take this new uh, 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 data source uh, for a spin. I have, um, you know, I'm the sort of person that has 30 different projects, so I've not gotten this project up as far along as I would like. But you know, the original plan you know, a couple years ago was, I, uh, was to follow Laycock's snowball strategy of identifying cases using traditional legal research tools. Um, the RISE plan uh, is actually to use the case law access project to pull all the cases that mention the word irreparable, uh, all cases that mention the word injunction, uh, and systematically analyze their content uh, using both hand coding in, in order to match and replicate what Laycock did, as well as uh, LDA, um, or potentially, uh, you know, depending on what I learn here and what other tools uh, people are suggesting for natural language processing, um, uh, something else. Um, I'm not as, uh, you know, uh, I've been able to successfully pull all the data uh, that I need for doing this. I've just not gotten very far along in the analysis. Um, what I will say that the, the, my primary concerns uh, in working with on this project are, have been a bit different uh, than the RA's uh, concerns on the um, Descent project. Um, and, one, uh, and one of the things that I would be on my wish list is a bit more uh, capability with regards to fuzzy search with the interface. So it, it's, it'd be one thing if uh, uh, to take existing fuzzy, uh, uh, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy search opportunities, if I had all the, uh, the entire data set all on my computer and were running things, or had, uh, had it all there. But uh, if I'm pulling a limited set from uh, the case law access project, um, uh, and uh, a case, uh, from the case law access project, a limited data set, um, it'd be nice if, uh, if, if there were systematic ways to get, you know, for example, not just irreparable, uh, but it, while searching for irreparable, the other things that are likely OCR errors for irreparable, right? Um, and uh, there are plenty of tools out there that, uh, uh, that uh, get to fuzzy matching. Uh, I don't know anything much about integrating them. I know that, if I, uh, that when I do have, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands or more uh, 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 documents, uh, I can do fuzzy matching internally. I just don't know anything about integrating them. Uh, into the search uh, uh, possibilities for um, the case license project. The other issue I had uh, is uh, baselining the data. So one of the things, you know, I pulled my 90,000 cases that mentioned the word irreparable, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if this, is, this usage has gone up or down over time. I'm like, okay, well, there are 6.7 million <coughs> cases. Well, I don't actually know how many cases there were in 1600, or 1620, or 1640. Um, I, I, of my 90,000 cases that include the word irreparable, half since 1990, or sorry, since 1980, is, does that mean it's gone up? Has it gone down? Well, you know, there's no obvious way uh, to, to get, num to just query uh, the case law API for the relevant number of cases uh, for a uh, certain criteria. Like, uh, I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I was like, well, maybe I should just pull the metadata for all 6.7 million cases, keep that on my computer, and just run it myself whenever I want, which is not necessarily the, a bad solution uh, for me, but it's not necessarily the ideal solution for other potential users. Um, that being said, so, you know, I, uh, you know, being the sort of person I am, I, I sent my slides in very late, and the, the annoying people here at the Case Law Access Project um, put something on live yesterday that, that speaks specifically to um, this uh, uh, last concern of mine, which is this historical trends tool, the Ngram tool that just went live yesterday. And so um, I sent my slides in late last night saying, aha, I'm going to throw in at least one slide from this historical trends tool, which I think is, is very neat and uh, speaks to multiple concerns uh, and, and uh, uh, that, I, uh, uh, that we, we've had. Um, uh, and uh, specifically, it gets to this both accessibility, ease of use, lots of people love playing with n-grams, right? Uh, uh, and all, all also gets to this baselining question. Now, the baselining is happening at your end, and I, I would like to be able to pull this, some of the specific stuff. But what we have here is, in fact, uh, the answer to my question, which I would, uh, did not have the answer to until yesterday, uh, which is, yes, in fact, the use of the word irreparable has gone up. Uh, uh, in, uh, in recent years, and not only that, it, it, some, I, 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 you know, the, uh, something that uh, matched my hunch, uh, the, uh, particularly the use of irreparable harm rather than irreparable injury. 
Um, and I can, uh, we can discuss that at some point if anyone's interested, but that's, there's a linguistic thing there that I'm curious about and we'll have to dig into more. But anyway, what I uh, sort of want to say is I, we have a great deal of interest at uh, UCLA Law in the sort of research potential of the Case Law Access Project. Um, we, at the moment, we've been focusing on it for fairly traditional doctrinal questions, sort of systematic analysis of case law. Um, but uh, we're eager to see what everybody else is doing. Uh, and, uh, and we'd be happy to uh, talk about how we can contribute to the further development of CAP. So uh, thank you very much. I'm excited to hear more. So uh, again, we have a little bit of time for uh, follow-ups here. Uh, I think you added only nine things to my to-do list. Oh, only nine. <laughs> Gosh, well, let's talk later. I can do more. I promise I can do more. I'm exaggerating. There's nine separate items there. Uh, so, so I get to start. Uh, and the, the first one, yes, and what I wanted to ask about is I know it's uh, been very important for the AI community to have challenge data sets like MNIST or ImageNet that everyone runs against. Uh, and we've been talking about the need for similar challenge data sets in legal analysis. Uh, when you start talking about these uh, papers that are published based on a thousand hand-coded things, that sounds like great fodder for that. Is there a yes and here about making some challenge data sets out? Yes, and. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, and actually, specifically, one of the things that's on my to-do list, I'm not gonna, it doesn't have to be on yours, but, <laughs> but on my to-do list is uh, Doug Laycox, at the end of his book, he's got every case that he hand-coded listed. And I'm, you know, and uh, I'm going to get that scanned, and then I'm going to uh, merge that and see what the overlap is with, the, with this project, and then see uh, if there's something interesting that can be done with uh, Doug Laycox. Uh, uh, any overlap, uh, an overlapping set of cases there. So I think there are lots of possibilities there. Um, I think that uh, one of the <laughs> things that you can look at in the traditional, uh, there, uh, you know, uh, the number of hand-coded um, uh, systematic analyses of cases has gone gone up dramatically, um, as I said, so, since since the '90s. And so I think there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, I've latched onto one particular one that I think will be fun. But you know, I, I will say I, I also think that you know, if I were to simply put up a, a list uh, uh, of the um, or links to of the citations to every uh, single case that has the word irreparable in it and link to it on uh, there, there would be scholars who would be interested in that, uh, even if they can't you know, do anything more than hunt and peck on a keyboard and, and sort of you know, maybe write an email. I, so I think that, I think that there, there, there are lots of possibilities for sort of looking at where systematic, uh, existing systematic uh, case law analysis uh, uh, have already been done and can be uh, uh, replicated, extended, uh, tested using other tools. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, somebody appro approached our colleague Larry Lessig and asked him what he meant when he said non degressive What was that all about? And, you know, is there a non degressive movement? Like, and Larry had no idea what they were talking about. And they said, it's right in your article that I found on Westlaw. And they, <laughs> he looked up his own article and read it. And sure enough, he had said that something was very non degressive <laughs> And of course, it was the OCR of naive. And it took the added yes. dot of the umlaut as yeah. a degrees sign. And so it was not oh. degrees eve. Oh, I love and uh, yeah, so Larry still says he's a member of the non degressive group. <laughs> and uh, that leads to an idle thought um, for which I would, would not put Jeff on the spot. Uh, right, so there's no photographer taking a picture of this <laughs> well. um, But it suggests, it, it's so interesting that we basically have at least two corpuses here that are putatively near identical, which is the corpus that Lexus has as the front line when we search, that's what we find. Double, triple keyed, I mean, there's not OCR errors uh, in the, the straight line Lexus cases that you pull up. Um, there may be other issues, and it would be quite interesting to do a diff between our corpus and that corpus, possibly with the aim of correcting the OCR errors with the benefit of the comparison or something. If we were really thinking big, which we shouldn't, we'd see if West wants in on the game, too, and we do a triple compare 
among them for the benefit of all. And so I don't know, it's just a, possibly an interesting idea because it's so great to see how that kind of correction would impact this kind of work in a beneficial way. So, so maybe an agenda item to discuss in the next two and a half years of our discussion. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, we have time for one or two quick follow-ups. That's only one. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be you. What do you think? Um, really enjoyed your talk. Um, there's actually a CAP API Ruby gem. I'm not sure if you're a researcher. They are aware of it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he, he eventually figured it out. But yeah, no. He, he, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, he's, you, but he, he's one of those, you know, he's been doing it his own way with his own, mm -hmm. you know, he's basically reusing stuff that he uh, created for himself and other purposes and repurposing it. So he's, you know, yeah. people do that. Cool. Um, well, if he wants to fork it and uh, make some changes, he can. I, do it. He's the sort of person he's going to be reaching out to you <laughs> well, guys more and more. That's like, great. Yeah. And certainly, in general, we welcome collaboration on building out that ecosystem. Well, uh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you.